welcome, dear listener, to Adventures in Coffee, a podcast by Caffeine Magazine, sponsored by our dear friends at Oatly. Now, in this second series, we're going to be taking you on a fascinating journey to understand what exactly is in your daily cup of coffee. Indeed, we're all trying to understand a little bit more about where our food and drink comes from. So we created this podcast to shake the beans of the coffee world and peek behind the porter filter. Now, I am Jules Walker, also known as Lady Velo. I'm a very proud East Londoner. I'm also a best-selling author, a presenter, and your everyday coffee lover. Oh, get you, Jules. Can I have your entire CV, please? (laughs) (laughs) My name is Scott Benley. I'm the founder of Caffeine Magazine. I'm also an art director that works in the branding fields. But... Let's move on. (laughs) Now, Scott, in in today's episode, we're going to be answering one of probably the most asked questions that we have. Oh, God, every single time. I mean, I literally get this on a daily basis on Instagram, (laughs) and that is, what coffee should I buy? Indeed. And you know what, Scott? I've actually been in that situation myself because I'm like, okay, I want to get myself some coffee, but where am I going to get it from? Which type of coffee am I going to go for? Like I'm bombarded with choices when I would just type coffee into to Google and I'm like, I'm getting dark roast Italian blends. I've got fair trade organic. I've got micro lot speciality. Okay, Jules. I, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm not done. Oh. Whole beans or, or ground coffee is also an option. How fresh should the coffee actually be? Like, do I get it from Amazon or do I do a Google random search and just like take my chances and right. find well, someone well, well, on? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> There's a lot there. There's a, there's a lot to unpack. There's plenty, okay. plenty. So when we were coming up with this episode, we decided that we needed to keep the whole thing quite simple. Indeed, we did. So in this case, I'm going to be hopping on the line with Andrew Potler of Pull and Pour Coffee to get the basics of this locked down. And I spoke to Jen Ruggolo, who works at the Specialty Coffee Association, to help me navigate one of the hardest questions that I always get asked. Mm. And that is, what's the most ethical coffee that I should buy? But before we jump into that world, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. And this is a sustainability hack brought to you by Only. Now, Scott, you know that our friends Oatly tell us that about 20% of the personal carbon footprint that we make comes from the food that we eat. Yeah, uh, and I've also heard that red meat is actually the worst. How much red meat do you actually eat? I think I probably have either one lasagna or spag bowl a week, maybe. Oh, okay. So that's not that much, actually. Um, What about the other people in your life? Well, if we take my dad for an example, he's a real meat eater and he loves a barbecue. In fact, Ah. it literally, if there isn't fat and blood dripping on the coals, it's not a real barbecue in his mind. (laughs) Have you tried proposing uh, maybe your dad doing like a nut cutlets on the barbecue (laughs) instead? (laughs) He might be well into it. He could be well surprised by that or like some tofu burgers or something like that. Something a little different. You should come and do stand-up, Jules. You're good at it. (laughs) But seriously, Jules, maybe I'll try and slip in one of those like gourmet spicy bean burgers. And if I put some lettuce and some cheese and some sauce on there, I think he'll demolish it without even (laughs) realising. If not, uh, tickets are five pounds a go to see me do stand-up. And that was a sustainability hack brought to you by Oatly. So, Scott. I wanted to figure out some really simple questions when it came to what coffee I should be buying. The Jules, look, this is super simple. Oh, yeah. You go to London, you find the most sort of like specialty coffee shop you can find you know, with like <laughs> full of like the coolest baristas. You ask them, what's the most expensive bag of coffee you got? And you buy that. <laughs> No, no, Scott, that's that's really not helpful in any way, shape or form. And that is exactly, exactly where I did not speak to you about this. Now, I wanted a more down to earth approach. So I hopped on the phone to this man. My name is Andrew Potler. I'm based in St. Louis in the United States. And I've run a coffee passion project called Pull and Pour that consists of a website where I publish reviews and articles about coffee and then also an Instagram account. Scott, out of curiosity, when you started up Caffeine Magazine, what did your wife have to say about it? Like, what did she think? Uh, She was actually super uh, supportive, but 
a lot of people that I told the idea to, they were just kind of like, who wants to read a magazine about coffee? <laughs> well, funnily enough, Andrew had something quite similar when he started up Pull and Pour. You know, my wife kind of laughed at me and she said, you know, people don't like coffee like you like coffee, like no one's going to follow you. And so then as it kind of slowly started growing, and then when I finally hit 10,000 followers, we just kind of laughed about it because she's like, okay, I guess there are people around the world that like coffee like you like coffee. I'm gutted, darling, that you have cheated on me. <laughs> You've gone to another coffee nerd. I, I mean, where does this leave us, Jules? I, where does this leave us? I thought when it came to coffee, we had an open relationship and that was okay. That's not the way I feel about you, Jules. <laughs> <laughs> so come on then what did you talk about behind my back <laughs> all right so the reality is scott is that most people probably do buy their coffee in the supermarket and even when you're in there that in itself can be very overwhelming you've got hundreds of bags on the shelves and there are different labels everywhere for you to have a look at right but Andrew did actually help me figure out a little trick to narrow down my selection so what you want to do is try and find that coffee that's as fresh as possible yeah, okay, I'll give him that. Mm. I mean, yeah, I mean, once it gets roasted, it does start to sort of lose its vibrancy. Exactly, and Andrew spoke on exactly that. So, Andrew, how does coffee actually change with time? So I think within that first month of roasting, normally maybe, you know, a few days or a week off a of roast until you get to that month point, is really the ideal time to drink the coffee. You know, it's going to be where it's the freshest, it's the most complex, and when it tastes the best. I think within three months of roasting is still like a very acceptable time. You know, most lighter coffees will still maintain their quality in that like four to 12 week range. There might be a little complexity that's lost, but they're still going to be really great coffees. I think between three and six months off roasting, you know, you really start to probably lose some complexity in the coffee, some of that specialness, that, you know, those depth of the flavors and, the, you know, maybe the number of fruit notes you can taste in that profile. I think anything after six months, the coffee most likely will be pretty stale. The coffee won't necessarily be bad, like it's not going to be you brew it and you got to throw it away, but it's not going to be anything like in those first few weeks after roast. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree 100% on all of these points, actually. Mm. Um, coffee doesn't go bad. Mm. And I think that's what most people don't understand. There's a difference between it being great mm -hmm. and it being off. So here's the, the thing, Scott. When you go into the supermarket and you're presented with all of those coffee bags, you'll see that there is a best by day and a use by day, which is kind of confusing. So I asked Andrew to give me some clarity on the difference between the two. Yeah, absolutely. So milk and other foods that are very helpful to have those dates because you know like okay this is probably when it's going to be best buy <laughs> coffee is not one of those like they have to have those dates on there to be on the shelf but it's not something that once you go past a use buy or best buy date with coffee that it's going to be like milk where it's sour and disgusting like it, it's <laughs> probably not going to be fresh it's not going to be nearly anything as good as it could have been but it's not going to it's not going to hurt you necessarily so I think the important thing with coffee is to try and avoid those best and use by dates and try and instead look for a roasted on date because that's right. kind of a clear marker of where that timeline started of it kind of being roasted and potentially getting stale. I think one thing to note is if you have a coffee that's getting close to one of those use by best by dates, that's definitely not fresh <laughs> and avoid that. <laughs> I, I would 100% agree with him on his mm. point. The only issue is that a lot of supermarkets don't want to put the roasted on date because that then really does show the age of the coffee. Right. And now you can use that kind of information to start to, I don't know, maybe examine the coffee bags on the shelf and try to find the date that it was roasted on. Yeah, absolutely, Jules. I think if you can, the best thing to do is to prioritise getting whole bean coffee. Yeah. And yes, that means buying a grinder, but they are relatively affordable. Now, there is a reason for mm -hmm. this, and I'll just try and explain it as quick as I can. <laughs> a coffee bean is essentially almost like sealed. It's got a very small surface area. Mm. As soon as you grind that coffee, it becomes powder, mm -hmm. and the surface area becomes much, much larger. And as soon as oxygen hits that surface area, it's already degrading. Of course. So if you can keep it as a whole bean for as long as possible, you're going to get it like better quality. So Scott, the one thing that I did learn from Andrew is that the supermarket is probably one of the worst places that I could buy my coffee because it's not going to be that fresh. So then the next best place for me to go 
would be to buy my coffee online. But then the overwhelmingness just starts all over again because you've got hundreds and hundreds of roasters that you could be looking at. Then the panic starts again. Which one do I choose? What am I going to go for? How do I choose it? But Andrew had a great piece of advice on this. So when you're at a coffee roaster's website and you're looking, you can look through the coffee section, but then they also normally have an about or mission section that gives a little bit of information about how they got started and what's important to them, like mm-hmm. sustainability, and see you know if that aligns with kind of what you're passionate about. So Andrew's point there is, is that you can actually get a handle on the overwhelming choices by first finding the roasters who align with your ethics. And Scott, another interesting thing that Andrew mentioned to me was the fact that you can actually have a conversation with your roaster online. You can go to one of their social profiles, reach out, kind of talk to them about the coffees, kind of tell them what you like. And a lot of them will write back. They'll kind of have a conversation. They love having those conversations with people. I would agree with what Andrew's saying here. Hmm. But what I would also say is, you know, we've got real life as well. Hmm. You know, you can go and see these people. And there are coffee roasters probably in your area. And we're going to drop a link in the show notes to a Google map, which shows over 400 like independent coffee roasters here in the UK. So you will be able to find something that's pretty good and pretty damn close to you. Now, one of the really good things about this is that by walking or by getting to one of these local roasters, you're going to be lowering your carbon footprint because you're not asking them to ship that coffee from, you know, from a different country or from, you know, the north of England to the south of England. Get on your bike. (laughs) Exactly. That's what I was thinking to myself, like unfold my my Brompton and go for it. And you know what? That was probably one of Andrew's best pieces of advice that he'd given to me, that you can find a local roaster or cafe and buy your beans from there. That's kind of combining the best case of both worlds. Like Mm. you're buying coffee, that's local, it's not having to be shipped across the world or a country. You're supporting a local business, you're getting it fresh. Most likely that coffee was roasted within the last few days, week at most. And then if you need to grind it, you know, they'll grind it right there that it's kind of at least freshly ground at the time of purchase. And so, I mean, the best coffee shops have baristas and people working there that are passionate about coffee, that know the coffee that they're roasting and selling. And so you can have that conversation with them in person. And also, you can possibly drink the coffee first, mm. order the coffee, taste it. Mm-hmm. If you like it, buy a bag. It's there. It's in front of you. You're, you're in person there and then. Just do it there and then. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've solved a, uh, another issue there. But you know me, Scott. I actually have another problem as well. Problematic jewels. Is this the expensive hobby that we talk about <laughs> off air? Off air, but say for instance, you're at your local cafe, right? And you've got a bag of coffee going at like big prices at like eight pounds and then even bigger, 12 quid. And then you've got a 20 quid bag of coffee. Which one are you supposed to choose? You buy the expensive one. It's obvious. (laughs) No, actually, Andrew did break this down for me, Scott. There are a lot of really expensive coffees you know if you guys have explored in previous episodes like there's geeches that are like hundreds of dollars (laughs) and i would say for most people like the nuance of that is not going to be appreciated it's just not worth that for sure Mm. but i think there's at the other end like the four dollar bag of coffee from the supermarket that probably isn't going to be the quality that you want either but i think like if you're drinking coffee every day you just need something that's kind of like a morning coffee i think that range there of 12 to 18 9 to 13 pounds is probably a good range to kind of be looking into. Again, it may not be like their most exotic single origin. It might be a blend or it might be an origin that's a little bit easier to source from. So it's just not as expensive, but that's okay. Like it's still good coffee. Again, just the higher price point doesn't always mean it's a nicer coffee. And I think one example of that would be like Kenya. Kenya is a great origin, but like they, it will always be more expensive. And I don't exactly understand all the economics around it, but just the process of getting coffee out of there, sourcing it, it just is a more expensive origin to get coffee from. Whether that coffee is better than the coffee you get from Ethiopia or Guatemala, you know, that's not necessarily true. So I think that's what's also, you know, South American coffees here in the United States, at least, are generally a little bit 
less expensive. I mean, at the end of the day, Jules, I think you need to find coffees that you like Uh and start there, really. I mean, for me, Kenyans are worth the money. I love Kenyan coffees. Okay, do you you want to hear something that's uh, maybe going to blow your mind a little bit? Is it just going to piss me off? (laughs) (laughs) Or is it actually going to blow my mind? Well, Andrew is a pro blend. Yeah, get him off. I I told you, he's no good for you, Jules. You should come back to me, babe. (laughs) And I think that especially if you're newer to coffee, blends are a really great option because it's just kind of that safer option that most likely is going to appeal to a wide range of people versus some of the single origins that can be pretty strong in one direction, like super citrusy, super fruity, which some people will love, but some people will hate. You know, there's a lot of coffees that my wife and I don't really align on our coffee preferences. She definitely prefers darker. Yeah. And I definitely like the lighter, crazier, wild flavors. So there's a lot of coffees I'll try. I'll brew and be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And, you know, she's like, oh my gosh, I do not like that at all. <laughs> no. And I think that the blends kind of would help ease those corners. Like they wouldn't give you those crazy wild flavors necessarily that could be off-putting to some. And so they can kind of help people that maybe aren't as familiar with what they really like and don't like versus single origins, which can kind of range the spectrum. I hate to admit it, but he has got a very good point. (laughs) And, you know, there you have it from my little journey with with Andrew that I I strayed away from home to to take. But, you know, (laughs) you... (laughs) You buy whole beans and you try to get them as fresh as you possibly can. When you're looking to to spend on your coffee, aim for between about nine to to 13 pounds per bag. And if you're quite new to the world of flavours, go for a blend. There's nothing wrong with that. And if possible, just to, you know, ease up on the carbon footprint side of things as well. If you have a local roaster or cafe that you can buy them from, get them from there. All good points, Jules. All good points. So, Scott, I've, I've taken on board all of the wonderful advice that Andrew had given to me, right? But I still have elements that I'm bamboozled on, right? So I want to buy my coffee, but I want to be able to do it very ethically. Again, I'm in a situation where I'm going to the supermarket and I see the certifications on the bags and you've got direct trade, you've got sustainability, you've got words like responsibly sourced on it. And I'm looking at it and just feeling like, I, I don't get this. Scott, mm. I need you to help me. All right, strap in, girl. This is going to get messy. <laughs> oh, boy. It's so messy, in fact, that a rather famous YouTuber decided to completely sidestep this. But uh-huh. I think it's really important that we don't. Mm. But we do need to contextualise a lot of this. Right. And taking each part kind of step by step. But to do that, I needed to speak to a bit more of an expert. So I spoke to this person. My name is Jen Ruggalo, and I work as a project manager and editor in Specialty Coffee. A lot of my time is spent on 25, a publication by the Specialty Coffee Association, which works to build a more sustainable coffee industry. But I also work with Place at Coffee, which focuses on collaborative learning and sharing. Okay, Jules. So look, first things first. Mm. Ethical, you know, ethical coffee, it's used kind of interchangeably with sustainability. Okay. Now, I think we all know what that means on some level, Mm. but specifically sustainability takes into consideration social, environmental and economic aspects. Okay. And when you buy coffee, you want to make sure that you're supporting sort of positive outcomes across those three things. Mm, For sure. And now we're going to start with a simple premise that if a coffee farm wants to do the right thing by their workers and the environment, it definitely helps if they can earn enough money to create a long-term and essentially sustainable business. Mm. But the reality is many can't. Mm. Look, the, the reason is that oftentimes the price that's paid by roasters, and you know, I hate to say this, even some specialty coffee roasters, is tied in some way to the commodity price. Mm. So it's going to be like X percent above the commodity price, but it's still tied. And generally, that price is really volatile. Mm. And for the most part, I mean, especially since sort of 2018, it's been low. I mean, I mean, like really, really low. At the height of the most recent crisis, I'm pretty sure that nowhere did that commodity price actually cover the cost of producing coffee. 
nowhere. And even when it is on the higher side of where it historically sits, it still rarely covers the entire cost of production. Yeah, and actually, um, coffee farmers have been in this crisis for such a long time now. And yeah, and this is very much part of Jen's job, um, you know, to stay up to date with all the coffee news. And she's reading all of these stories. You know, farmers in Kenya are uprooting coffee so that they can plant um, avocados. Uh, Farmers in Malawi are uprooting coffee so that they can plant corn because it doesn't require three years to mature and they get are subsidized, right? And that's the other thing. So you have government subsidies subsidizing other crops. And so, of course, you would grow something else if you can't make a livelihood off of this thing that maybe your family has been doing for a long time. So we're just going to lose that available pool of coffee. These people are going to find other work. Well, that makes sense what Jen is saying. I mean, if coffee isn't giving you enough, then you need to get out of farming coffee. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why wouldn't you? But that's really bad news for us. Mm. If we stick with the commodity price and farmers no longer see this as a way to have a thriving livelihood, we're not going to have access to the wide selection of quality coffee that we, especially coffee consumers, currently enjoy. It's just not going to exist. And essentially, coffee will become more generic, less special. Yeah. We'll go from where we once were, yeah. which was everything's kind of a bit blended up and a bit generic, to this lovely time we're in at the moment where we can source coffees from all over the world different terroir wonderful flavors Mm -hmm. and that will go oh hang hang on a second generic dull coffee i mean what will that mean for us at adventures in coffee scott like our podcast is our baby if if our coffee tastes boring then we will end up with a really boring show well i suppose we could change the title to adventures in avocados Uh, yeah no i I do not (laughs) know Now, look, I wanted to understand from Jen, where's all the money going? Mm. Because it feels like we pay good money for coffee. So there's someone making some decent coin out of this. It certainly ain't the farmers. Mm. Who's taking all the cash? Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I I don't like easy questions. No, it's, it's a really great question. And I think, you know, if you look at sort of maybe just the pure monetary sort of end of things, um, you're seeing that more at the consuming side of the chain. You're seeing that within the brands who are selling the coffee to the consumers. They're taking the bigger slice of the pie right now. Oh, so, so it's like the roasters then. Yeah, kind of. But that being said, if you talk to any specialty coffee roaster or cafe, they're not going to tell you that they're rolling in cash, right? Mm. So it's not just about needing to make the pie bigger. It's more about needing to make sure that everybody has a more equal slice of pie so that we're actually rewarding the risk and the effort and the time the producers take to grow coffee in the first place. Okay, so we want to direct our money towards the places where we can help grow this pie that Jen's mentioned. Mm. As in, like, we we pay more in and then the coffee farmers themselves will get more of that cash, more than they've actually been getting historically. Okay, so I think I've, I've got it. But what does that actually look like, though? I still don't know what coffee I should buy. Okay, Jules, this is where it starts to get a little bit more messy. Um, Mm. And so I suppose in a nutshell, I can't give you specific directions, Mm -hmm. but there are things that point to and suggest Mm. that a roaster is doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you can look for is certifications. And almost always, if a coffee has a certification, that would have been bought at a higher price than the commodity price. So you have Fairtrade, US and International, both of those brands, 4C, Uts Rainforest Alliance, Organic. Yeah, but the thing is, Scott, that we explored this in one of our earlier episodes on Adventures in Coffee, and we found a whole host of problems with that. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you, Jules. Mm. But if we're talking about a journey and we're talking about stages, commodity is the worst. Mm-hmm. The next thing that we can be looking for are certified coffees. But then that's not a silver bullet, you know. And actually for Jen, the biggest problem is that certifications expect the farmers to put in all the graft and all of the money to get themselves certified. And that's just kind of not fair, really. That's not ideal, right? You're making people jump through big hoops to earn a little bit more money. 
I mean, there are a million other things that we can unpack with certifications, sure. but I suppose for simplicity's sake, let's just stop here for now. Okay. So we've got commodity and we've got certified coffee. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing to look at are for those roasters who recognize that they are in that most privileges of places in the supply chain mm. and therefore are taking it upon themselves to do the work to prove their sustainability credentials. Okay. Um, like what? What are they doing? Personally, I always look for the roasters who offer transparency reports. You know, it's not mm. a silver bullet, but when I see a roasting company mirror the transparency that we so often ask of producers at the consuming side of the chain, it tells me that they're aware of that power imbalance at play, and that's an important start. And Jen also floated the rise of the B Corp certification as a potential, mm. another positive sign that that roaster is committed to doing more of that hard work. It's a way for companies at the consuming side to take on more of the burden of reporting and transparency. Like everything, there are, it's no silver bullet. There are some issues with it, but it is an exciting sort of push in the right direction, I think. OK, so benefit corporation, the, the two words together sound good. But what exactly mm. does it do? <laughs> what is it? Essentially, businesses that can prove that they are hitting those uh, high standards of, you know, officially verified social and environmental things. Mm -hmm. And they are then able to hold this badge of being a B Corp. And you can be kicked off of B Corp okay. if you don't keep up. You know, it's not something you don't just buy it. Yeah. You have to do the work. And again, this comes back to greenwashing. Mm. It's all very well saying, oh, we are this. But if you're not officially verifying that, then it doesn't really matter. It's essentially just greenwashing. So these companies are doing more things to kind of be more trustworthy. Okay. So we should be looking for, for coffee companies that are actually doing these transparency reports. So B Corps will better mm. correlate with good outcomes for the farmers. Yeah, absolutely. And because you, you know, as a coffee drinker can read that report. Mm. And if you see that that roaster is not buying a coffee farmer's coffee every year, coffee farmers go through hard times and they go through good times. Mm. But if you leave them out to dry when they had a bad harvest and you're not buying their coffee, then that's not a good relationship. No. And you can raise this with your roasters. I mean, you have the power to do this. You know, we as consumers wield an incredible amount of power within any sort of market system, coffee or otherwise, right? And so absolutely, you could go to your roaster and say, I really want you to invest in these longer term relationships. I want to see the same coffees year on year. But unless you vote with your wallet for those same things, unless you are willing to sort of pay for the same coffee from the same roaster sort of year on year as well, um, you're not going to show them that that's a good business decision for them. And so that is one way you can really use your power positively as a consumer. So Scott, these are the things that we should be looking for. What about mm. the things to avoid? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Jules, my darling, oh boy. this is where it gets interesting. <laughs> if someone is painting a really rosy picture for you of the fact that their coffee is the most sustainable, the most ethical, it's almost kind of like that cognitive bias, the Dunning-Kruger effect, mm. which is, you know, if you have low ability, you are more likely to overestimate your ability. And if you have really high ability, you're likely to underestimate your ability. Um, That's very interesting. And so, you know, companies that understand the trade-offs and the complexities of sustainability are never going to talk about their coffee as if it is the most sustainable thing out there or the most ethical thing out there because they understand that it's really complicated. Mm. Companies that don't are going to shout it from the rooftops. Okay, so... If it is too good to be true, maybe that's because it absolutely is not true. Look, yes, but, you know, and this is where it gets complicated. It, you know, it even gets a bit murky. Mm -hmm. um, so let me tell you about a little example that I brought up with Jen. I picked up a tin of coffee the other day from a very well-known uh, um, coffee company. There was a logo on there mm -hmm. in, in some lovely sort of hand-drawn type, mm -hmm. and it said grown respectfully <laughs> yeah and, and for me that just kind of said well i mean as someone who's been in marketing and design for for a number of years yeah. 
I know that means zero. I think if you're sensitive to greenwashing anywhere, you're going to be sensitive to greenwashing in coffee. Um, mm. The language is always the same. The language is really generic, like you said. It's it's respect and it's um, it's sustainable and it's you know it it's those things. It doesn't get into any detail and it doesn't use those clearly defined words. And there isn't anything to back it up. So Scott, it sounds like to me you need to have evidence. Like, don't accept woolly terms. Yes. But but here's the thing, and there's another thing to add into the mix. I'm sorry. I know it's an, another thing. <laughs> okay. Um, and we've discussed B Corp and we've discussed transparency reports. And these are all good things, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But these are all things which essentially are kind of like the roasters doing a bit of a self-assessment. So there's some like really important initiatives that, as an industry, we need to come together to solve like these big problems of pricing. Okay, then, Scott, what are they? This could get a bit wonky, so bear with (laughs) me. These are literally at the cutting edge of what specialty coffee is doing at the moment, and they are the specialty coffee transaction guide. Mm -hmm. So is the roaster contributing to the specialty coffee transaction guide? And is the roaster supporting living income assessments? And these are look really complicated projects that are essentially going to solve very big problems within the coffee industry. Hmm. So look at it like this. Is a coffee roaster shouting about a small project where they threw some money at it and they're waving their little flag and saying, we own this? Or are they paying into a much bigger thing that solves a much bigger problem and they're just not going to get so much of that sort of kudos out of it. Mm. But if that problem gets solved, man, that's going to change stuff. I think I'm going to attempt to sum it up from what I've taken from it. Okay. So you should choose roasters who are actually trying to demonstrate that they're part of the speciality coffee team and that they're actually working collaboratively to solve these problems of low prices. So you don't have them centering themselves because that's a a red flag if it's just them and and them alone. Mm. Also look out for these transparency reports and B Corp certifications, you know, whether they actually contribute to the speciality coffee transaction guide that you mentioned or whether they support these living income assessments, right? Absolutely. And you know what? These are the things that you should be possibly looking for once you've already narrowed down, you know, to like a few roasters that you want to buy from. So just kind of go one step at a time and you'll find someone pretty close does pretty much what you want to do, mm. doing the right kind of thing. It's possible. It is possible to do it. Absolutely. The good thing is, if you find a really good roaster that's doing really good things, you haven't got to keep switching around. You haven't got to keep doing all the research. Mm. But Jules, do you know what? Look, I know this has been complicated. I know we've really got into the weeds on this, but I just want to close out this episode with something that Jen said to me that was very, very powerful. No one faults you for, you know, trying to make the best decision possible and maybe not making the right one, right? But you do have the power as a consumer to be able to change this if you really want to see it change. This is making me feel a lot better just thinking about how confused I have been in the past about buying coffee and how to buy it correctly or smartly or ethically or what have you. There are tools that I've taken away from this and I hope our dear listener has that too. All right, Scott, thank you so much for that journey, but let's have those credits. So, dear listener, we're literally drowning in ideas for Series 3 and we want to hear from you. Now, we have put together a survey that will help us understand what episodes you liked and how we can help you on your coffee journey. So follow the link in the show notes. And while you're there, you can support the show on Patreon, but you can still complete the survey even if you're not a patron. Now, Scott, Christmas is just around the corner and we've got some great discounts for all our Patreons who are signed up to the caffeine dealer option. Absolutely. Our friends at Dog and Hat have given us a wonderful discount on their coffee subscription service. So, you know, maybe pick up a subscription as a Christmas present for the coffee lover in your life. Mm-hmm. And you can also get money off brewing equipment with our friends at Coffee Hit. So follow the link in the show notes. Now, this podcast was produced by James Harper, the creator 
editor of the coffee podcast, Filter Stories. And he also wrote and plays the piano music you hear in the background. Now, if you like the show, uh, you can help others find it by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. And I need to stress this really clearly. Mm. Five star reviews <laughs> only, people. <laughs> anyway, this really helps the show gets picked up by the algorithms. Yes. And of course, with social media, you can also follow Caffeine Magazine on Instagram. So you can find Scott at Caffeine Mag, myself, Jules at Lady Velo, and of course, James Harper at Filter Stories Podcast. Now, dear listener, we're taking a much needed break. Uh, now, Jules, what are you buying, Ian, for Christmas? Is it going to be that espresso machine that you've always wanted? <laughs> yeah, it will be exactly that. You know, it's going to be a bit like the year that Santa put those really expensive geisha coffee beans into your kids' Christmas stockings. Uh, look, look, what can I say? Santa has got great taste. <laughs> <laughs> now, we will be back in January to close out season two. And up to now, we have been helping you on your coffee journey but we're going to be pouring something a little different into our cups that's right we're going to be pouring some wine in there instead Ooh. and we're going to be collaborating with another podcast so stay tuned indeed so until then dear listener we will see you again soon take care bye bye <laughs>